Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're doing the MS3 standalone install on uh, O3 Cobra Project Redfire. There's been a lot of interest with O3, O4 Cobra owners with the standalone uh, plug and play version out, the MS3. And there's a lot of questions and I think you guys will find this one interesting. We're going to go through, show you what's uh, included, what you, what you get with the kit, how it all goes together, and we're actually going to install it in the car. Go through that process, we'll do a basic base map show you how to get the car started and that way you have a foundation to start tuning the car all right so when you order your kit you this is what you get essentially an ecu the heart of it all looks just like your stock ecu same connector you can just plug it in a few small differences though you'll notice there's a port over here and that's to hook up a boost vacuum reference they include some hose for that, so it makes it super easy. And of course on the 0304 Cobras, it's right behind the glove box. There's already an existing connection. You got a, a little T you can T into there, feed it in, and that way your ECU knows exactly when uh, it's in boost and it's not. That's actually the preferred way of tuning these. And instead of using the mass airflow sensor, of course that's entirely up to you. I personally don't use the mass airflow sensor. I find this map sensor works beautifully. So that's how I do it. Uh, also along here, you have a serial connection and they include a serial cable for you. It's got the connection right here for the ECU. That end is your uh, where you connect your own serial to USB cable. This is something you will need to get a hold of on your own. Uh, I've had a lot of them over the years. I found a lot of connectivity problems when dealing with the MS3 using my own USB to serial cables that I already had laying around. I recommend you purchase theirs or from EFI Analytics, I think it is. Theirs works flawlessly. All my problems went away once I switched to their cable. The other thing you get is an optional connector on the back. And that's for additional features that are not available on a stock ECU, of course, that are you know unique to the standalone. And they give you a cable um, that you build yourself, basically. You've got all these wires pre-crimped and the terminal block that'll snap in here. And then you just populate the wires that you want depending on what features you want. That way you don't have a whole huge harness of wires hanging out that you don't use. You just, just hook up what you need and go from there. And that's basically all there is to this. It's fairly simple. They'll drive your stock gauges, which of course is the huge attraction to this particular ECU. Um, there are obviously other standalones and everybody has their preference. This particular one has, in fact, that's why Dan requested it for this car, because he wanted to retain his stock gauges and this will drive all the stock gauges with minimal effort. Just plug it in and, and off it goes. All right, step one, let's disconnect the battery so we can avoid any of those, whoops, that one's supposed to happen. <laughs> My case, that's in the trunk. All right, next, we're gonna go ahead and get access to the passenger kick panel area right here so we can get access to the stock ECU to pull it out. Uh, don't mind these wires here. This is from our previous video where we did the CAN-based wideband install. These wires are gonna get wired into our optional connector onto the MS3. Uh, in a little bit. If you haven't already seen the CAN bus install, you might want to go take a look at that. You'll see how it ties in with the MS3. Now we have access. In here, we're going to pull this stuff out and get access to the ECU back there. Okay, we got everything out of the way. And one of the first things I'm noticing here is that I have this extra wires hanging off here. Uh, it looks like the four right on the end here, and I think it looks like the other four on the other side back there. If I had to guess, this car had probably had a JNS Vampire in here before because it looks like it's tapped into the ignition wires. It doesn't change in anything with this install. We can still go ahead and pull this ECU out and proceed. You can see the replacement ECU is actually just a little bit smaller. Help gives you a little bit of clearance with this back connector that you're going to have some wires coming out of. Optional, of course, Choose, uh, assuming you use anything on there. Otherwise, the exact same connector up front, we're going to plug it in. Except now we're going to have a vacuum line and we'll run our serial cable for connections to control it. So with the way the harness swings out, the orientation, your ECU is going to install this way with the logo pointing up top here. And then it's going to curl and go back in that way. That puts the vacuum tubing connection out here on the outside. So you're going to run your vacuum line down on the outside here or your right hand side as you're facing it. And the serial connection is going to be down on that side. And we'll run the serial cable up here somewhere where we can just peel back, pull it out when we want to hook it up to the laptop, just tuck it away when we don't need it. So let's go ahead and get this vacuum line run. It's going to come up here. I'm going to go behind the glove box. And inside of here, you'll find the factory vacuum line that runs off. Well, this has been modified. Okay, but it basically looks like this. 
and uh, we can slice in here and put a T. Uh, this car has an additional boost gauge, uh, wide band slash boost gauge installed up there. That's why somebody's modified this to T in there, but it's very similar stock. In my case, I'll add another one here, feed it off. Okay, I have the ECU all hooked up and ready to go. Got the main harness plugged in and attached. I got the serial cable on the end here, it goes right here. Plugged in on the side, on this end, I've got my boost slash vacuum reference line right here. And then I went ahead and populated some of the pins on the optional harness and I have that plugged in the back. I have an idea I'm gonna hook up a temperature sensor into the inner cooler under the tank and see, uh, monitor those fluid temps. We'll incorporate them directly into our data log so we can see what's going on there. I decided to wire up a wire to my second fuel pump. So if I do choose to stage it, I can just do that right from the MS3. Simple, no, no worries there. Uh, of course, I have the wide bands, the CAN data coming in, and I also have the trigger wire so I can control my wide bands when they turn on, off, etc. directly from here on the configuration. And this is the flex fuel input. I'm going to go ahead and convert this to a flex fuel car shortly, and I will do an upcoming video on that. I'll show you how you go about doing that, and we'll convert this into a true flex fuel where you just do, you just pump the gas and go. You don't have to flick switches, you don't have to flash tunes, you don't have to do any of that. When reinstalling the ECU, you're going to have to grind a little relief in the bracket that holds it in place where the map sensor and vacuum line now goes. You can see I already got a, a notch cut right out there. Okay, we have our ECU installed, the panels put back, everything closed up, we're kind of ready to go. Next, you're gonna load on the base map or tune that comes with it, or you can just download it off their website. That's a good starting point if you don't have anything else to do. Uh, or you can be like me and just build one from scratch because you really wanna learn how it all works. But I only recommend that if you have a lot of time and you really wanna dig into it. Otherwise, just load a base map and start tweaking it. You're going to have to change for what injectors you have, um, what setup you have on your car. You know, for example, the fuel pumps, almost all these cars always have return style fuel systems put in by the time they get to an MS3. Uh, in fact, that's so common. I think we'll jump to the trunk here in a second and I'll show you what you have to do to make that work with the plug and play version. There's going to be things that are saved in the firmware of the ECU itself and not part of the tune. For example, calibrating the TPS, you're going to want to do that. You're going to calibrate the uh, the map sensor, temperature sensors, stuff like that. They should come pre-calibrated since it is a, a PMP, but I would take the time to look at those settings because when you update the firmware on the ECU, there's a good chance they're going to get wiped and you need to reload those back in there because they're not part of the tune, they're part of the firmware on the ECU itself. And I'd highly recommend you upgrade it, by the way. <clears throat> They seem to be shipping with 151, which has been around for many years. And I can see why they would ship it with that. It was the stable version for a long time. But 152 has finally been released. And I've been using beta versions of 152 for a long time as they've been progressing through the different stages of it. And the reason is because it addresses a lot of annoying bugs that are in 151. Uh, even if you're running a mostly stock car, one of the annoying is an idle bug when the car, after either revving it or starting it, and it tapers down to idle, there's a bug where the taper values don't actually uh, have any effect. It just drops. And you can cause surging and stalling and other strange things. Uh, that Just fixing that one bug alone is worth the upgrade. Also, if you're a flex fuel guy and you're going for E85, there were some calculation errors in some of the older ones. And as they worked up through the revisions, that bug was found. And when I upgraded on a different car, you know, past that point, I had to recalibrate the 85 portion. So save yourself the hassle and just update the firmware right away, 152. When using the MS3 to control your fuel pumps and you've converted to a return style fuel system, but you still want to have proper pump activation, find the old fuel pump driver module connector. It looks like this. The bottom right hand corner of that, it's pin seven. No, wait, pin one, I believe. I'll, I'll look at the wiring diagram for the exact pin, but it's the bottom right corner. It's the white wire with a red stripe on it. That is the wire that the MS3 is going to provide a ground output to trigger your pump. And by ground output, I mean exactly that. It's going to provide a ground, not a 12 volts. So for something like this, this car has an FC3 4 controller, which is very common. So a lot of guys will have either FC2s or FC3s in them. They actually require 12 volts to be applied here to trigger them. So how do you deal with that? Well, you can invert it with a couple relays. So I created fuel pump one, fuel pump two. And the way this works is key on power goes to the relay and from the relay feeds to the input here to turn this on. But the ground for the relay is provided by the MS3. So the MS3 essentially controls it. It turns the relays on and off, which in turn supplies the 12 volts over here. And the reason there's two of them is because I decided to 
use two different outputs for the two different pumps. So if I decide I want to stage my pumps, I can easily do that in the software without having to do any additional wiring. Okay, at this point, uh, we got nothing left to do except uh, let's just swing the key and, and see what happens. So by this point in the install, you have the base map in there, your basic setup done that we've discussed so far, the car starts, idles, uh, maybe a drive around the block. It should at least rev freely to about 3000 RPM. Now you're ready to do the next part of setup, which is to validate timing. And I don't mean timing in the tune, but I mean validate that the timing commanded at the ECU is actually the timing that's happening at the motor. You can't just assume that's correct. And we're going to check that with a timing light. Just a plain, simple, dumb timing light. Don't use a fancy one with the dials and adjustments. They never seem to work right. It needs to be just a simple um, timing light like that. We're going to have to get a mark on the damper because these cars don't have timing marks from the factory. I have it up on jack stand so I can get underneath because there's so much stuff over here. I literally can't get in and see it or find a spot to shoot it correctly. Now to get a timing mark, I'm going to set cylinder number one to top dead center. I like to use a piston stop and the back and forth method, get the marks, split them in half, get my TDC, and that'll be zero degrees. Then I can go into the ECU and I can set it to a fixed timing of zero degrees when it's idling warm at temperature. And take my timing light and shoot the mark that I've made previously. And if my timing light is slightly off like that, I can tell it's not correct. And inside the software, there's an offset feature where you can adjust in degree increments and move that until those lines line up. And at that point, the timing that you're commanding in the ECU is exactly the timing that's happening at the motor. Very important. You want to have that correct for a variety of reasons, especially if, say, for example, you work on your engine, you pull some stuff apart, put it back together. You don't want to have to start with a new tune. You'll be able to just recalibrate that back in and boom, you're back on your old tune. So that's a huge advantage. Once that's working, the next thing we're going to check is the ignition hardware latency. And that is literally the latency that happens from the time the computer says fire this spark plug to the time that it actually fires. There's a delay over there. And the, it's very easy to check. All we do is with the car idling again, we get a timing light and we check those two marks and they're sitting there. And then you have a helper rev the engine, push down on the gas pedal and smoothly rev it up to about 3000 RPM. And if you see those timing marks drift and the timing retarding at the motor, you're experiencing that hardware ignition latency. There's a spot inside the, the Tuner Studio software where you can adjust for that latency. And the idea is when that engine revs up through the RPM, those marks should stay right there. So you'll increment that number a little bit at a time until you get rid of that latency and it's spot on. At that point, all your setup's done and you're ready to actually tune the car and start having some fun. All right, I got my timing marks made, so let me show you what I got going on here. Got my cylinder number one spark plug out, used my handy dandy little piston stop tool and turned the crank back and forth. Let me show you the marks under here. Okay, so here we can see the marks. I turned the crankshaft one direction, and when it hit the piston stop, I made a mark, and that lined up with that mark right there on the oil pan. I made the two of them. Then I turned it the other way around, and this one lined up, and I made that mark over there, same spot. Then I had to split the difference, which I used a piece of string and measured to make sure I got that exactly right. That's my center point. So now that is exactly a TDC, so this is my zero degree mark. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use some acetone and clean these two outer ones off to avoid confusion when I shoot the timing light. But when I shoot the timing light, I line up these two lines and I'm at zero degrees. And that's my reference. All right, car's nice and warmed up. I took it out for a drive, got it up on some ramps so I can get underneath for the uh, timing light. I had to remove the intake over here to get the uh, pickup on coil cylinder number one. Luckily, this car doesn't use mass airflow sensor anymore, so I can just leave that off and start the car just like that. Uh, I got the laptop right there, which will set to zero degrees once this is nice and warm. And we'll shoot it with the timing light and take a look and see where it's at. Okay, notice how smooth and nice the idle is right now. When I knock it down to zero degrees timing, you're going to hear it's kind of be laboring and kind of struggling because that's our hardest hard for it to idle, but that's where we got our marks. Alright, that's 
really close. I'm gonna try and shift it by maybe one degree. All right, we got the timing dialed in. Now we're gonna check the hard rate latency. Gonna rev the engine up to about 3,000 RPM and see if it drifts. All right, timing is dialed in, and we ended up having to adjust the base on there two degrees from where it was preset from the uh, factory. It just shows the importance of checking your specific car. What's interesting, as we shifted those two degrees, it came within one degree of the yellow car of where I have it set. And it's got a built motor, which I expect is being tinkered, but this is a stock motor. So even on a stock motor, there's gonna be factory tolerances. As far as the hardware latency, it was spot on on this one. And it was very different. The hardware latency on this car versus the yellow car, big difference. This has the ignition coil drivers on the PMP circuit board. Mine has separate driver boards that are inside the dash because it's a you know custom build setup. And they, they take different heart rate latency. So just shows, check these settings, make sure you're good. This thing as far as uh, install is kind of dialed in the timing portion. So uh, time to start playing. Some worse than others. This car has it real bad, so it's a great example to show you. Next time, we're going we're to show you exactly what this issue is, what's causing it, why it happens, and what you can do to mitigate it. Um, there's things you can do to reduce it, make it a little better, and then there's an absolute fix that just cures it. Poof, done, gone. Just like the money in your wallet if you work on cars. <laughs> Alright guys, so until next time, I'm going to go ahead and rip on this thing. I mean, drive, drive it. Uh, tune it. I'm going tuning. Scientific work needs to be done. All right. See you next time. Cut. How was that? One take. Pretty good. I'll tell you what's really going to disappear is this cookie. I'm hungry. Oh, you guys are still here. Next time. Next time.